Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Jazakallah khairan to everyone for joining uh, once again on this blessed month. Inshallah, it's a month of immense benefit. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our siyam and our qiyam a means of forgiveness uh, for all that preceded it. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine in our dua, inshallah. Uh, may Allah allow them to continue to return to the masjid, even if the occupiers despise it. Allahumma tahir masjid al-Aqsa min rijasli al-Musta'mirin, inshallah. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, I believe today's topic is especially pertinent, uh, which is taqwa in the world. Uh, as a brief reminder, we began this month with Brother Iyad Hilal introducing the topic of taqwa. Uh, how it's understood and how it functions vis-a-vis -vis the ahkam shara'iyah. Uh, we then had Dr. Rahman al-Sarar speak about the topic of how to con how to cultivate taqwa uh, and focus on better conceptualizing that. Uh, and he talked about both the Quranic discourses on taqwa as well as positioning it in relation to human experience. Uh, he also added the dimension of taqwa and self-restraint. Today we'll be talking about taqwa in the community, which is that how can the community be a site of cultivating taqwa and how is that removed from dominant trends which may portray taqwa as a more individualistic exercise that's threatened by questions of community or questions of politics or governance? As a reminder, uh, last week's session, as well as the coming sessions, will be posted on our different social media outlets. And I'll go ahead and send them in the chat right now. Uh, and before I introduce today's speaker, inshallah, we'll have Brother Hadis Ansari start us off with some brief recitation of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah, we'll just be reciting Surah Al-Asr. As it has to do with the topic of today, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asr. Inna al insana lafi khusr. Illa al ladhina amanu wa aminu sanihat. Wa tawasamu bil haq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says By the declining day Man is in deep loss Except for those who believe Do good deeds Urge one another to the truth And urge one another to steadfastness The Quran Alright, Jazakallah uh, So today we're joined by Dr. Awim al Anjum. Uh, Dr. Ayman Anjum is the Imam Khattab in the Chair of Islamic Studies at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Toledo. Uh, his work focuses on the nexus of theology, ethics, politics, and law in Islam with a comparative interest in Western thought. Uh, Dr. Anjum obtained his PhD in Islamic Intellectual History in the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, a Master's of Social Science from UChicago, and a Master's in Computer Science and Bachelor's in Nuclear Engineering and Physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, in addition to the academy, Dr. Anjum has studied with a, a wide range of scholars in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. Some of his works include Politics, Law, and Community in Islamic, in Islamic Thought, The Taymiyyah Moment in 2012, uh, Ranks of the Divine Seekers, which is a translation of Ibn al-Qayyim's Madarij al-Salikin, and a plethora of other articles that can be found on Yaqeen, uh, Academia.edu, and Aegis. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Anjum additionally serves as the editor-in-chief for Yaqeen Institute and is the founder and chief research officer of Omatics. Uh, as a reminder, before we begin today's session, make sure to direct all questions to the moderator uh, labeled Ziad Q&A, and we'll go ahead and have a chance to have a bit of a Q&A after the talk. And without further ado, Dr. Anjum, the floor is yours. Zakam al khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا ولك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا وسيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Today my topic is taqwa and the world So let me start by reminding ourselves of the um, um, call in the Qur'an by our Lord Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to cultivate this thing called taqwa, to cultivate this feeling, this emotion, this perhaps habit and character that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls taqwa and it is such a lofty feeling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls to it uh, more than any other when directly addressing the believers 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون Oh, you who believe have taqwa of Allah as is the right of Allah to have that taqwa on the part of his servants and do not be caught by death except that you are in uh, a state of Islam and submission to Allah. Ya ayuha nas attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahidatin wa khalaqa minha zawjaha وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا. O oh you, O oh people, have taqwa. So the address now is to all humanity, have taqwa. Uh, one of Allah who created you from one being and then a pair and then distributed you throughout the world. And then, especially, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fear the one in whose name you ask of each other's rights. This is a very interesting uh, construction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in speaking about taqwa, talks about himself in a way that is unique, as far as I know, in the Quran, which is, he is the one in whose name we ask each other of our rights. The sa'aluna bihi wal arham. We should have taqwa of the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whose name we build our relations. Building of relationships is the building of the world. World as human beings conceive of it as we interact with it, is relationships. And those relationships, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are built in the name of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what it means to be a Muslim, to build the world in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ask each other of our rights, our duties, According, in accordance with the word of Allah and uh, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is as if in our very, in, in the very DNA of the world, in the very gulu that holds together our world, it is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, if you will, the other glue, which is al-arham, the wombs of our mothers. May Allah uh, forgive and have mercy on those who have passed away of our mothers and fathers. And uh, may Allah uh, give comfort and give long life to those of our mothers who are alive. But it is the fact that we come from the wombs of our mothers and that's the second sign as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have to fear, you have to be mindful of, you have to be conscious of those relationships because that's if you will the second glue through which our world is created and then um, this um, pattern of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calling us to taqwa but calling us to taqwa in the middle if you will in the middle of the battle of life rather than in escape from it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, in Surah uh, At-Taraq, when speaking of um, how to divorce, and this is a time that is one of the most painful experiences in the life of any human being to part from someone you've loved. And it is in that experience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, that if whoever fears Allah whoever has the taqwa of Allah um, and I'm going to define taqwa inshallah fear is one component of it but it's perhaps the most powerful component of it um, Allah will make a way out in the world, again, it's taqwa in the world that is 
having remembering Allah while you're in the middle of pursuing um, goals of this world, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, sometimes you're triumphant, sometimes um, you lose and um, you bite the dust and um, you know you regret, you have guilt, uh, unresolved feelings, no closures, a sense of worthlessness. And it is at that time that people, when they're angry and hurt, that they tend to strike uh, most uh, cruelly and without concern for others, without concern for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without concern for the glue that holds us together and without concern for the relationships we have built. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that whoever at this point, Allah reminds us, that's the right and perfect time that you need a way out. And the way out is not to set taqwa aside, the fear of Allah, piety of Allah, love of Allah, uh, aside in favor of uh, raw expression of raw anger and revenge. But rather, it is precisely at that time when you are an injured, a wounded animal, when you want to hurt, that you have taqwa of Allah because that is the best way to find relief so that taqwa becomes connected in our minds, in our hearts, in our experience uh, to relief, to way out, to way out, to way out of conundrums that seem to be intractable and impossible. So this is the feature of taqwa that I want to talk about today, inshallah, a little more, which is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches taqwa in the Quran uh, through practical struggles by uh, orienting us to the world rather than uh, orienting us away from the world. And there is a deep, uh, this is a deep characteristic feature of Islam of the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is in perfect harmony with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, that we are creatures that grow with experience. We are capable of fooling ourselves in isolation, but as soon as we interact with others with real life, when we are challenged, we are tested, it becomes much more difficult to hold on to our theoretical constructs, our abstractions. And that is why there's a, it's a beautiful saying, I believe in Madarij al-Salikim, the Qayyim, rahimahullah, quotes from someone, that having taqwa or having fear of Allah, having nearness to Allah, um, by engaging in isolationist exercises, by isolated uh, practices of training for worship um, and in the ma'iyah of Allah, the witness of Allah, in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the long path to Allah. That's the long path in the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do exercise of uh, self-reflection, which is very, very important. But the way that many mystics, many religious people um, have done both in Islam and in particularly in other religions, um, particularly Christianity, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in particular, Rahbaniya, monasticism of Christians. In isolation, right, people take pride in um, abandoning the world, leaving off the world. Um, I was just reading recently of an account of some Greek monk, uh, you know, in Eastern Europe, there are these monasteries that still are functional, where this monk lived for 80 years, never saw the face of a woman. And that was the, um, that was the greatest praise on the obituary that this was um, a man who never saw women. But that is not our deen. That's the most remarkable thing that that's not running away from 
what is attractive and beautiful and engaging and what brings to us uh, multiple dimensions of life is not the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran teaches us taqwa. Uh, when the, some of the Sahaba, as I'm sure all of you are aware of this famous story, when uh, a few of the Sahaba came, and of course the Sahaba were living in the world, they were in, uh, aware of practices of piety, righteousness uh, around them. They may have been influenced by um, what other people talk about, uh, the stories of, of, of maybe great saints of the past and so on about taqwa. They came to the prophet's uh, uh, wife, mother, mother of believers, uh, ask about uh, his practice and his worship. And when she told them, um, they thought this wasn't much. It was easy. And they said, you know, oh, Allah has forgiven all your sins, O Prophet ﷺ. Um, there is no need for you to do those things, but we uh, are sinful creatures. We must. So therefore, they one of them pledged to celibacy. They're never going to get married. Others said that they're not going to seek shelter that means you're going to be homeless and out in the sun as a form of um, self-mortification punishment of the flesh because sins are supposed to come out of flesh in that tradition um and a third one said i'm not going to eat meat and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um uh, um and, and in, I think in one tradition, it's also that I'm going to pray at night and not sleep. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard that, um, it displeased him uh, visibly. And he said, I marry women, I take shelter, and I sleep, and I pray, and I eat meat, and whoever abandons my sunnah is not from me. So this is the way of the Prophet ﷺ to get involved with the world, to partake in the world, and then practice taqwa, and then um, find a way, right, to, to be, if you will, engage with the world, be lured by it, by attra be attracted by it, construct, try to construct it in accordance with the, um, the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, in accordance to the uh, the vision given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran, in the Sunnah, in Fiqh. And it is then when you get involved in it, you love some of it, you hate some of it, you have opinions about it because you're involved now, you're made up of those experiences. And then you abandon it uh, partially, selectively, when, as and when asked of you, like uh, in the practice of the beautiful month that we are in, the most miraculous month, I often think to myself, in which um, my kids who are unable to stay away from food, from, from dessert, from treat, uh, the minute it comes, it disappears, right? If you have good food, they jump on it. They can't wait for dinner to be set up. And it is these same kids who fast, for 14 hours, 16 hours straight and are not tempted in the same way. It is as if, uh, you know, I tell them that it's almost like a, a superhuman that comes out of you guys because uh, resisting candy is a superpower that you never have. Um, but that's, that's the kind of power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in this month. Um, and in this practice of fasting and this commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, but this is a partial, um, right? It's a, it's a partial deprivation, a partial renunciation. And then we go back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُ الْبَرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not reach piety, you will not reach birr benevolence and piety, which is a synonym for taqwa in the Quran, until you spend from that which you love. Um, 
And similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We yutamun at ta'ama ala hubbihi miskina wa yatina wa yatima wa asira. They spend, they feed uh, uh, others even though they love it. So they gave from what they love and they give so much that it hurts. Um, but what's remarkable is that they love it, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the believer says, you do love it. You do love this wealth. This ayah makes sense, or these ayat, these instructions make sense to people who love life, who love beautiful things in life, who love comfortable things, um, who love relationships um, with their spouses, with their children, uh, who invest in those relationships who are asked to invest in those relationships. And the more you invest in those relationships, the harder it is to abandon them. And then they give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both by way of their time and their wealth, so much so that it hurts. So it is, it, it is as if the strategy of the Quran um, and the Ahkam al-Hakimin, the wisest of all wise judges, uh, is that you grow in taqwa not by abandoning the world but by going to it by reconstructing it by engaging with it and then always ensuring that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all of those commitments uh, i recall a story from uh, madarij al-salikin or a couple of examples in fact that imam ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah uh, gives in order to make a similar point when speaking of the Shara'i Quranic way of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, rather than um, um, intense, isolated exercises for long periods of time, which are not uh, given in our Sharia, ah, although, of course, uh, if those who have, those who have time uh, who can make um, you know, worship at night, Qiyamul Layl, is that kind of isolation uh, that is uh, highly encouraged in our deen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who engage in Qiyamul Layl because there is, there is a sweetness of, of being alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is not in other things. There's no doubt about that. Um, and there's a beautiful virtue of tabattul, of cutting off, severing yourself from the world and some of the greatest uh, people, particularly greatest women in our tradition, are called Batul, um, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fatima Zahra was a Batul, and Maryam was a Batul in the sense that she severed herself from the world in order to worship Allah alone. So there is beauty in that, but... Um, That is not all there is, right? In our tradition, there is, in our deen, there is um, tabattul. But then the Prophet ﷺ also tells us, and the Quran tells us, to go out to the world. Tawasaw bil haqq, tawasaw bil sabr, Surah Al Asr that was just recited. Um, it's engagement with the community. And the Prophet ﷺ says, المؤمن الذي يخالط الناس ويصبر على أذاهم خير من المؤمن الذي لا يخالط الناس ولا يصبر على أذاهم. The believer who mingles with people and then is patient at the harm that comes as a result of that mingling, as a result of those interactions, as a result of socializing, um, he or she is patient is better than the one who avoids it in order to avoid the harm of the people. Because it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying socializing, going out, mixing with people, and so much you could say, right? And this uh, fitna comes out of mixing with people. Um, so you have to, of course, be careful about choosing your company. But the instructive thing here is that that is better. That is the path of Islam. That is the strategy of the Qur'an. That you have to engage with the world. You have to try to construct with the world. Um, and when you talk to people, you have to sort of lure them. You have to uh, learn manners, how to talk to them. 
Anyway, so going back to Ibn al-Qayyim's point, um, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a shortcut to those higher stations of nearness to him on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is khuluq hasan, good character, courteousness, um, in engaging with people, it gives you a shortcut to paradise, sh shortcut to those higher stations. How? Because in isolation, as I said at the beginning, you may learn tremendous insights and, and you ought to spend time with the Quran in isolation um, and reflect on being by yourself when you're, when you're praying at night. Um, or even when you're praying by daytime, even in the masjid, that is a part of you that is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But then you go out, you say, assalamu uh, alaikum, and then you have to interact with people. And then you have this young person who doesn't know how to behave. And you think that you're so pious, you have prayed for so long, and you're so knowledgeable. And this person puts you in your place and tells you not to do this or tells you to do this or doesn't call you by the right title, or doesn't uh, address you in the right way, or corrects your mistake, perhaps uh, even in a way that's incorrect, uh, challenges you on social media, right? That's the biggest uh, weakness of people these days. Um, and, and all of a sudden, all this training you had, all this uh, time of self-discipline, all this, you know, had built up in you your own image of being a pious knowledgeable somebody and all of a sudden you're a nobody and to be able to be prophetic a prophetic character akhlaq of the prophet وسلم, in that moment um that is it gives you 10 years of isolation in one interaction you have to use all of that if it was any good your your nearness to allah your worship of allah if it was any effective, if it truly gave you humility, if it truly made you an abid of Allah, a servant, a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it would show. And if you had cracks in that edifice that you had built for yourself in your own mind, then the, build, the building that then you will crumble uh, in one social media tweet or in one uh, person being rude to you or challenging you, you will lose your temper or you will try to put them down and you realize at that moment um, what you needed in this interaction was so much more and the prophet وسلم, our prophet uh, وسلم, تسليم, often when you look at their <clears throat> and the kind of uh, the, the kind of harm and challenge that he had um, much more than the uh, physical harm that he experienced um you know his teeth were broken and things were thrown at him um and he was hurt in other ways but nothing was more hurtful than when people humiliated him people insulted him he was a very sensitive being that's one of the most interesting thing interesting things about the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he was as a human being a very sensitive person uh, so what people said mattered to him and that very character of being sensitive and gentle was made him so endearing to people because he genuinely cared about people he was genuinely hurt by them um, the non-believers and the hypocrites the munafiqin would say to each other Hua udun, he is an ear you know as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates in the Quran he is an ear, meaning he hears everything. You tell him anything, he will hear, he will, he will believe you. He's that kind of person. Um, as if they're saying that he's gullible. He wasn't gullible. He was just sensitive. He cared about people. And it was possible, therefore, to hurt him. We typically build wall, walls around us uh, because we feel that we might be hurt. And so we don't make ourselves available to other people. So the Prophet ﷺ wasn't like that. <clears throat> and people whom he may have suspected were not good people or hypocrites. But even what they said when they insulted him, 
the Prophet ﷺ wanted good for them. And because he wanted good for them, he hadn't written them off. That's why what they said hurt him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds on his behalf and he says, Wa He is the ear of goodness for you, <clears throat> who believes in Allah and believes the believers. He believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yu'minu billahi wa yu'minu lil mu'mineen. And he believes the believers. Whatever they tell him, he takes in, in the best faith, in good faith, in the best faith. Um, and, and that is the, the character of the Prophet Sallallahu that was um, that practice taqwa, right? And because when he is hurt by people, then he's able to show his character. Um, and people are insulting him, people are insulting his family, um, people are insulting all things that are dear to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes you in fact hear that concern that Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has for his most beloved creature, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Oh Prophet, they're not insulting you, they're insulting the Quran, they're insulting their own creator. It's not you. Um that, O Prophet, you, is it as if you are going to um, kill yourself. You're going to, you're harming yourself so much, you're taking it so personally that you are harming yourself because of their. Um, intransigence, their, their intransigence, their refusal to believe out of their own folly. So their folly is hurting you, O Prophet wasallam. And that why that is why the Prophet's suffering, Prophet's struggle was so much greater than if somebody physically hit him. And, um, and that is what, that was part of his training. That was part of his training. He was concerned about people. In fact, at first, when the wahi came to him, according to some traditions, um, he wanted to throw himself off, uh, off a cliff because he was worried that people are going to say that he has become majnoon, he has lost his mind. Um, and that was such a great dishonor uh, and would be so hurtful for him. Um, and so, it is at this time that the Prophet Sallallahu you know, in, in, this, in this way that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala trains the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through, it is as if through the harm that he receives from people and then he, is, he turns to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, begging him for guidance. And even in those moments, uh, often he prays for them rather than praying against them. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gives him tarbiyah. Uh, in some situations, the Prophet ﷺ is inclined to pray against them, right? And as we read in Surah Al-Amran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those moments takes his messenger, Ali salatu wasalam, to an even higher status by telling him that it's not up to you to pray against them or to decide whether Allah will punish them or not. Laysa um, min al-amr shay'un. So this is the way uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us taqwa. Um, to complete um, other examples, uh, and then I will stop, inshallah. Uh, other examples that Imam Ibn al Qayyim gives, and this, in fact, he says that um, he has this interaction with his teacher, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, about this problem of muhasaba self-reckoning, self-examination, self-criticism that um, we are supposed to engage in. What is the best way to do it? And um, it is very easy when you are in that mindset, when you're alone, when you're isolated and you're thinking about your flaws to, uh, to lose, uh, if you will, a sense of balance and uh, to see nothing but bad things and try to remove them from the way by training yourself, um, if you will, by isolating yourself from the world and from action and by saying, let me become perfect first, then I will go out and change the world, 
right? That is a tendency that many of us fall into. And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah gave him a, a beautiful example. He gave him an example, uh, two examples, in fact. One, he gave an example of walk, let's say walk in the park. He said, if you, when you go out for a walk in the park and you find a harmful animal, say a snake or a scorpion or something, um, what do you do? One thing that you could do is you find a snake or a scorpion or something dangerous and you decide that you will, you will not continue your walk in, the, walk in the park until you have rid the park of all the snakes and all the scorpions and all the potential dangers and all the thorns that might get in your way. So instead of continuing your journey, you now go after the snakes and the scorpions and the thorns and all the things that you dislike about the park. Um, and you're not unable to continue the journey. So the way you, in fact, continue the journey is you just take care of, maybe kick away the one thing that um, was in your way, and then you continue, you go on. You know that you cannot, uh, uh, you know, send uh, snakes into extinction in order to start, uh, continue your, your journey. That is an example of human nature. You cannot remove all your ills and all your shortcomings or those of other people before you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to do. You have to continue walk in the park, knowing that you are imperfect and other people are imperfect, as our Prophet Sallallahu did. And as you are in this walk, in this journey, you're going to, you're going to encounter and then you take care of those uh, threats that you encounter, those um, encumbrances that you encounter in that journey. And then you continue. The other example that he gave um, I think is also a very productive example to think about and think with, is that of, think of your nafs as batus. Uh, batus is a grind mill on which people, you know, are made of really compressed, uh, compressed uh, and, you know, cooked uh, clay. And you use it to grind your spices and whatnot. But let's say you decide that before you're going to grind your spice, before you're going to uh, use your batus, you're going to clean it up. And you clean it up with, you know, with rough um, sandpaper and you bring the biggest chemicals out and you scrubbing your batus. And the more you do so, um, the more dirt comes out of it because it is nothing but dirt all the way to the end. It is made of dirt. So try to clean, cleanse your nafs of all possible errors and all possible shortcomings before you in, engage in using it to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like cleaning the batus with a sandpaper. You're not going to find an end until there is no batus left because you're made of, uh, made of shortcomings and errors. And it's only in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you seek refuge and you seek direction, and you continue uh, your journey. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu um, says, if you, you know, if you stop sinning, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will remove you people and bring those who do sin, and then do make tawbah to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because Allah knows how He has created us, and He loves to hear and accept our tawbah. So, um, this is a short, if you will. Um, this would be my answer, my long answer to uh, people when they ask me, you know, you talk about politics and the ummah, and you talk about the khilafah, um, how does that fit in with when you talk about madarij al-salikin and journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taqwa, and what is the relationship in short between taqwa and the world? Uh, in my view, uh, as a humble and flawed a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and of the Sahaba. This is the only way I know. This is the way we go about constructing the world. That we have to have our journey, our true north is Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it is through these experiences, uh, even when we fail, um, 
but trying to change the world in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded us that we acquire taqwa uh, and alhamdulillah rabbil all right jazakallahu khairan for the insight um we'll now move into q and a inshallah um so the traditional format is if anyone has any questions feel free to send them to ziad q and a and uh, we'll go ahead and try and prioritize those questions uh, but if you would also like to unmute or raise your hand and unmute and ask your question live, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll give you that option. Um, so if anyone has any questions right off the bat, please let me know. Okay. Uh, while you're thinking of them, inshallah, we'll go ahead and move to Q&A. Um, the first question is, if not secluding from others, how do you maintain that self-reflectiveness to continuously keep the nafs in check? It's harder to see problems in the nafs in the moment as opposed to being removed from the situation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is hard to see problems of the nafs both when you're in isolation, when you haven't interacted, and while you're in the moment. In the moment, you're overwhelmed by emotion, as you correctly suggest. And when you are, when you have not interacted or you have forgotten what interaction is like, you do not have any motivation. Um, so what you need is something in between, right? We need something that you need to be principled about uh, when you, in, in, about investigating and examining your interaction with people. How did I interact? What did I do? Or how did I even deal with the situation in, in my own self and this is the way that you know where you stand and this by the way is a general uh you know general situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also in our own relationship I I often advise couples that you have this problem that when you guys are happy together you're not going to address your problems because you don't want to ruin it when you are not happy together, then is the emotions are too high to discuss what you don't like about the other person uh, or what annoys you. You have to have discipline in being able to correct yourself and, and, and be able to express what you find um, maybe dissatisfactory. Um, and they that that requires um, deliberate action, you know, that requires muhasaba if you want to improve a relationship. The same is true for our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and our uh, training of our nafs that you cannot go to either extreme. Um, and, you know, of course, famously, this is a story that uh, uh, it's a popular story, but that that goes with the earlier point I've made that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did his isolation and tanassuk as the Arabs used to know at the time um, before revelation came to him but when when revelation came to him um, he never went back there the point is not that he never factually went back he might have gone back to the Mount of Hera but that he never went back in isolation because he was where his work was with the people but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him when things were hard in Surah Al-Inshirah, for example, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْسَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرَغَ when you're, when you're done with your daily duty of calling to Allah, uh, فَانْسَبْ Then focus. Establish yourself even more with greater focus and attention. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرَغَ And turn to your Lord alone. So that um, uh, aloneness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very important. That's what that's what Qiyamul Layl was an obligation for uh, the Prophet وسلم, and early Muslims. Um and um Surat uh, you know what we what we learn in Surat Al Muzammil um uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet salam, to pray all night, most of the night, half of the night, and then at the end of that surah we learn which came in Surat uh, in, in Medina. Uh, that the Prophet ﷺ had been praying, and 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 a group of believers, among um, among them, all night almost, or two thirds of the night, and so on. So, this was their isolation, and all dies 
So this is a, as a matter of principle, all du'at, anyone who takes up the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a higher duty, higher responsibility, and higher need to have that time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my talk wasn't at all to discourage alone time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather to say that we do both. We must do both in order to acquire taqwa properly. Yeah. We do have uh, Brother Iyad with his hand raised, so we'll talk if you would like to shine in. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Waymer, for this presentation. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I just have minor comment I would like to mention. Uh, regarding a very side point, it was not, of course, related to the main theme, which is uh, about the Prophet Sallallahu report that he was trying to throw himself from the cliff or from, or from a hill. Uh, actually, I went over the reports that mentioned this. It's mentioned, you can find it in three books, at tabaqat by Ibn Sa'd, and actually, he reported it from Al-Waqidi. And Al-Waqidi is weak, as it is known. The second report is from Tabari. And the report which Tabari mentions cannot be accepted because there is problem in the, in the matin. He talks about the wahi that came to the Prophet Wasallam. The very beginning of the wahi was just when Jibreel came to him. It was a dream. Which, is, which cannot be accepted. He came physically while he was in the cave. Now, regarding the third book is Al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari uh, mentioned the beginning of the Wahi in different books, as you know, in, in, uh, in his Sahih. In one uh, chapter, he brought this incident. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't mention it in all other chapters. But Ibn Hajar, uh, commented on this, he said, this is from Balagat Zuhri. He said, the way the report is mentioned, Az Zuhri said, Thumma Balagana, and then it reached us. So it is from Az Zuhri, Balag from Zuhri, the declaration from Zuhri, without mentioning the Senate for, for this. And of course, uh, uh, this cannot be accepted. Another point, it was mentioned that Sayyid Aisha asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let me read from my computer. Sayyid Aisha, Allahumma arba'anha, she asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, هل أتى عليك يوم كان أشد من يوم أحد? Did you go through a day in your mission more severe than the day of Uhud in which he was wounded? عليه الصلاة والسلام. He said, لقد لقيت من قومك ما لقيت وكان أشد ما لقيت منهم يوم العقبة. I went through a lot of things from your people. The worst was in the night of al -Aqaba, when he was to meet the Ansar to take the, the, the bay'ah from them. So he said, I approached some people uh, and uh, he didn't respond. Ibn Abdi Alayl. He said, He did not respond positively to me. And so I went and I was sad and I slept, didn't wake up except in, in, in a certain area he calls in that territory in, uh, surrounding Zumaka, Qarn al So it means that if, 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 it, if that attempt was mentioned, was recalled by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would tell Sayyid Aisha about it. Let alone that the concept of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attempting suicide actually goes against the very uh, notion of the Isma. So uh, this is what uh, I would like to, to mention and uh, sorry for having long comment. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, 
there are no comments to that, we can move on to the next question. Um, do you think the learned helplessness you've described with respect to the Ummah and its affairs emanates from the same tension between practicing taqwa in a concrete moment versus isolation? In other words, it's easier to maintain taqwa without working, dealing with others, and confronting tricky situations. So, quote, well, siyasa is najasa. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, connection. I, I have not made that in my mind, but I will think about it, inshallah. The next question is... Uh, in what ways does secularism play into the disconnect between taqwa and the community? And as a, that's a very good question. And I believe that secularism um, has naturally the seeds of making this problem, which is not a new problem, right? We find this in our history um, already all the way back to the Sahaba that Taqwa was connected to self-mortification and uh, abandoning the world. And Rasulullah brought them back to balance. That was something that, uh, that, that in other words, that's a, that's a natural human instinct um, uh, or a natural human failing, let's say, to misunderstand um, the true source of taqwa. Because the way I think of taqwa, the one way to think about taqwa is like, you want to do bodybuilding, right? If you want to build a strong body, uh, one possibility, one way, and some people in the past, in fact, perhaps thought that way, um, is to just eat a lot. Eat a lot of good, great food, strong food, better food than anybody else, and, and not waste any of your energy. Just lay around and eat food. That would not make you a bodybuilder, right? That will not make you stronger. What makes you stronger is when you challenge your body to lift weights that are that are slightly beyond its comfort zone, but not too too far beyond. If it's too far beyond, then uh, your body is unable to do it and uh, reacts to it in different ways, either by breaking or or not trying. So I think that. Um, this is a, a natural um, misunderstanding of what taqwa truly is and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Quran is, if you will, the best bodybuilding mechanism, the best taqwa building mechanism is to go out and do tawasaw bil haqq and do tawasaw bil sabr and do amal salih. And, and you, you will have to then go back and, and, and build the muscle that is needed to, to continue to do it. But secularism is interesting uh, as a condition and a challenge because it uh, comes from a perspective that separates the world from taqwa. Uh, secularism has no problem if you are engaging in piety um, in your private life, but you're not trying to change the world according to it. That, if you will, the fundamental term of secularism is you do not change the world according to your taqwa unless your taqwa is the secular taqwa, unless you have accepted all the terms of this is how you're going to construct the public society. And if you want to um, hail Caesar or you want to build up your nation uh, as part of your religion, good for you. You can do that. In fact, secularism loves to uh, put religion under its yoke and conscripted for its own purpose. Uh, that, in fact, um, is the proper definition of the proper workings of secularism, not to separate religion from politics, but rather to put religion um, to work in service of uh, secular, disworldly goals given by the state and the state elite. So because of that, it's very important to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not have taqwa of the state. Or uh, if your goal is, if your fear is that you simply fear um, falling behind in the race for civilization and development, as unfortunately has happened uh, to some trends among Muslims, that 
they have taqwa. So this is different kinds of maladies, if you will, that uh, uh, that uh, 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 that assail us today as Muslims. There are some for whom um, taqwa has to remain only private, and in the world is constructed by forces of kufr and shirk and so on. And they don't let the two mix. That's the model is, this is my private life, that's my public life. That's convenient, but it always fails. And they always become um, uh, servants of a system that uh, that is godless. And the other problem is that they have taqwa, they want to train themselves, but their goal becomes civilization, taqaddum or hadara or taraqti and so on. And they measure everything in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by measuring how their actions or their projects or their strategies um, match up with those goals of, of, of worldly development. Now, this is not to say that worldly development isn't important, um, but... Taqwa must always be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, um, secularism threatens that in, in, in perhaps unique ways. Okay. As a reminder to the audience, if you do have a question you prefer speaking out rather than me reading it, by all means, please raise your hand and we can allow you to unmute. Um, the next two questions are relatively the same, but are relatively um, similar topics, but we can start with the first one. Uh, somewhat of a tangent, but why is asceticism or abandonment of the world such a commonly accepted means of attaining higher spirituality or religiosity? Allahu Alam, I think this has been a, I mean, I can give you the intellectual historian's answer which has to do with some really powerful ideas in the pre-modern world. Uh, you find that in Plato, Plato's uh, ideas, but particularly after uh, Plato, in the centuries after, um, there's uh, Neoplatonism begins to take Plato's teachings and turn them from a philosophical way of life, if you will, to religion. Uh, so Neoplatonism was really a philosophical religious tradition. Um, and those traditions um, and other such traditions, they were mystery religions where um, there was a the, this idea, which may have been even older than Plato, that this world is made up of this matter, which is evil, created by the evil God, and then... Um, Um, spirit is a good God, uh, is the creator or the creator of the spirit is a good God. And um, everything that pertains to this world is evil, created by, if you will, the evil God. There is these two forces at war. So these are the two sources. One is, if you will, Zoroastrianism. And the other is Platonic ideas. Both of them are anti-materialist as a religious uh, if you will, religious commitment. And uh, those ideals may have affected how many religions, particularly Christianity, which is really rethought after its encounter with Platonism, very little of actual messages left. The philosophical nuts and bolts of Christianity are all uh, Neoplatonic. Trinity cannot be understood without understanding Neoplatonism. So, um, that's why I think <clears throat> this is a very popular and powerful idea that matter is bad and you are punishing the body in order to strengthen its spirit or its soul. And this idea creeps into even Muslim traditions in various forms. Allahu Akbar. Okay, well, and then moving on to the next question then. Uh... More specifically, uh, how did Sufism in alter or influence the concept of taqwa? Ah, so Sufism, one could argue that Sufism doesn't have a single 
vision of taqwa, but if one thinks of mystical Sufism, and I differentiate between what might call orthodox Sufism from mystical Sufism, um, mystical Sufism is one that has a clear philosophical foundation for what it's trying to do, as opposed to those Sufis like Junaid ibn Muhammad and others, uh, rahimahumullah, who were reflecting on the movements of the soul and who were, they certainly had ideas that may be extra Islamic, but they were in deep conversation with the Quran and, and the Sunnah. Um, but the philosophical, mystical Sufism um, does change, if you will, the goal of worship. The goal of worship is to attain a kind of union that is here and now. Whereas in ibadah, uh, that we find, what we find in the Quran is that there is always in the full revelation of truth, full unveiling of truth, there is always an element of time, meaning that you will know the truth after this struggle. You have to struggle now. You have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to submit. And then there will be a day of judgment. There will be death. Or maybe even in this, uh, in this very life, there will be moments of truth in which ayyamullah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them, um, in which the truth will become clear. But the truth unfolds in time. Worship Allah until yaqeen, which is death. Um, comes to you, right? So death, there is time. But the notion that emerges in philosophical Sufism, which is taken from Neoplatonism, is the idea that the truth can be unveiled uh, through knowing the right idea here and now. So knowledge will set you free. Literally, the idea that, uh, you know, appears in the Christian tradition as well, knowledge sets you free. Um, it's used metaphorically these days, but it actually, this was one thing that mystics took literally. Knowledge will literally set you free in the sense that there is a secret, there is a mystery that if you know that you are no longer uh, constrained by uh, this, uh, by limitations of this life. And that's why the idea that you do not have to follow the Sharia, the antinomianism, right? Uh, the idea that you don't follow the Sharia that Sharia obligations do not apply to you. It was very common. It was extremely common, shockingly common in Muslim history among various groups, precisely because, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, it's very attractive. Um, and people could use verses like this, <laughs> you know, uh, worship Allah until certitude comes to you. So you translate yaqeen as certitude, and if you're certain, then you no longer have to do that. Similarly, you could use the idea of Khadr, for example, alayhi salam, uh, um, the mystery man who meets Musa, alayhi salam. Well, he was above the Sharia. Why? Because he was Waliullah. And therefore, wilaya is superior to prophethood. There is knowledge of prophethood that is external. There is internal secret or botany in inner knowledge that is higher, superior, that, that raises you above those restrictions. So those were all ideas that could be uh, that could be mobilized to take um, the idea of uh, worship in a different direction. So your worship then could be just for the purpose of reaching to that point where you have been liberated in this life, um, or um, you could use worship uh, that is a different tradition. Uh, worship not as a means, an obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a constant need that you have, but rather as training uh, so that your thinking could be clear. So philosophers particularly uh, and philosophized Muslims were uh, fond of this idea that training, uh, ibadah is a kind of riyada, is a kind of training in order to... Um, uh, clear thinking. Intellect is the, uh, of course, this is uh, an idea that comes from Plato and Aristotle, that intellect is the, is, is the essence. It's the most important uh, 
existence, it's the most uh, important activity, is to think. And um, so long as, you know, you could clearly think and intellect the truths, the real truths of the world, then worship was no longer necessary, or it was even, you know, generally it was said that it was, these things were for the amma, for the commoners, who did not have the training to know the right thing. Uh, there is a quick comment. Uh, this is why I appreciate Professor Anjum's insights as his thoughts and talks are always making connections to our worldly civic life with any aspect of Islam, unlike other uh, scholars or ustads who keep parroting and recycling what others have said in the past about giving it much thought. I've never heard about taqwa in a more interesting way, which also gives answers to the questions and maybe misplaced understandings of apolitical pietists. Uh, the example of a walk in the park was very apt. Do you have any reflections on that? Or? Alhamdulillah, I hope you're right and make dua for me. Uh, we also had a comment by a brother, Imad. Uh, I will allow you to unmute now if you would like to, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Jazakumullah uh, khair. Professor Anjum, Jazakumullah khair for your presentation. Uh, uh, you introduced this concept that there are two paths for taqwa, the long one and the short one. The long one is the ibadat and the short one is the actual interaction with the people in the society uh, facing the challenge to do that to, in compliance with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, my humble uh, um, you know, observation uh, uh, in studying or, uh, you know, contemplating this subject came to a different conclusion I would like you to comment on. It's that uh, the ibadat, uh, uh, the prayer, salah, um, you know, siyam, uh, also the tafakkur uh, in the uh, fil khalq, uh, the contemplating the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reading the Quran, that they, these are the practices that uh, strengthens our relationship with Allah, gets us closer to Allah, the qurb. They are not actually the taqwa or the manifestation of taqwa. And that the taqwa is actually where you call it along the short path, which is actually is the byproduct, uh, the result of, uh, of qurb to Allah, is that you will be able to interact in the society in the right way. Uh, based on the deen of Allah and uh, that the, it's not one or the other and that there is no need to take time off as if you're uh, we, Allah prescribed the prayer and the reading of the Quran and all of those things can be done in parallel uh, I don't know what, what you think about this uh, but it seems that uh, the, this is different, uh, and I don't know how you, how you would uh, think about it, uh, if you give me feedback. Thank you for the question, and I, I thank you also because in case there is any misunderstanding, I want to clarify that. I didn't mean to say that the two paths are one is a path of ibadah and then the other path of akhlaq. That's not at all what I meant. Um, the context of that question in Ibn al-Qayyim's uh, um, treatment of this is isolation and in both cases you're doing ibadah but one ibadah is an isolation by abandoning the people you know people used to do that for 40 years or 40 days or 40 weeks or what have you that was the way to acquire taqwa is by isolating yourself and uh, or by becoming fuqara for example not engaging in earning money the world you know just receiving money from people begging uh, because you're involved in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those were the traditions that were the background of that comment, that instead of isolating yourself, you the best way to do so is exactly as you said, that you do ibadah, but our ibadah, our prayers require building masjids together, making jama'ah together, deciding who is the imam, who is the leader, who makes mistakes. So it's very communal, right? You're always interacting with people. So ibadah is not isolation in our case. Similarly, uh, fasting, it requires interacting with the world. It requires fighting with people about when Ramadan is starting, require, when Eid is starting, right? So all of those things require interaction, strategy, um, and, and uh, engagement with the world. Hajj more than anything else. 
uh, zakat, knowing about people who is poor, right? So all of our ibadat, our engagement with the world, while also giving us time, uh, different kinds of uh, opportunities to show our commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, nor do I want to put down uh, tabattul or isolated one-on-one -on -one time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or uh, uh, qunut, which is the practice of worshiping Allah for a long period of time alone with concentration. These things are the nuts and bolts of taqwa. If we don't have them, then our activism or our construction of the world is going to greatly suffer. It's going to be hollowed out. It's going to become um, um, shallow. So we must also invest in dhikr and qiyam al-layl and the reading of the Qur'an. And different people prefer different things. The best is to do all of those things. Um, and in, with a balance, but uh, those are not the two different paths, right? In both, you can you have to do, you have to master the practice of ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to love to do it. Um, but the other path was isolation, which I, I understand, if I understand from your comment, you are in agreement with. Yeah. Zafalo Khairan. Um, and it seems like the final question we have for now is, uh, how do you see the early Meccan surahs relating to the dual message of Tazkiyah as well as improving society? Ah, very good question. Um, so early Meccan surahs are, you know, if you read early Meccan surahs, they're almost remarkable in how strongly they connect <clears throat> like it is as if taqwa, tazkiya, and um, your practice of giving to the poor, caring about the, the poor, uh, sharing your things as simple as sharing your sugar and salt with, uh, with your neighbors. Like those practices are so inter intertwined that you can't separate them in the Meccan surahs already. So engagement with the world is not any less in the Meccan surah. It's it's just form is different, right? Its form is not in in Medinan surahs. The form is more collective, um, and engagement with uh, whether it's jihad or dealing with social problems um, that come from building a community in Mecca. Um, they are uh, much more immediate um, conundrums, ethical, practical conundrums that people face. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the Meccan surah, is very strongly connects um, action in the world, charity, uh, you know, and uh, helping the poor as... Uh, so strongly, justice, e what we might call economic justice, so strongly with, with piety. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like those are all the questions we have for today. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and conclude just a little bit early. Uh, I want to say Zakhwa to Dr. Ayman Anjum for taking the time out to uh, give us that talk and answer our, our questions. Um, Inshallah, next week we also have Dr. Uthman Umrji who will be talking about taqwa in times of hardship and how your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and your image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala impacts how you view hardship and how you uh, look at life. So inshallah, make sure to try and attend that. Uh, and with that, inshallah, we'll go ahead and conclude. SubhanAllah, wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma ja'ali shima'na hadha shima'na asuma wa ja'al tafarruqna min ba'di tafarruqan marhuma. ولا تدع فينا بيننا شقيا ولا محرومة ولا عصر إن الإنسان لفي خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته